All right, everybody, everybody, every, all you everybody's out there, you good people. You got to be a good person to watch me. That's what I come to conclude. Because you watching me because you want to learn something. And you like Black history. Or you don't like Black history and you want to like Black history. Or you are curious about Black history. And this is where you get it. Straight no chaser. I don't fool around. Let me tell you something, my friend. I don't fool around with this. I let the people do the talking because they know what they want to say. I just come up with a few questions. And if you don't know, I'm Anthony Brogdon. I'm an ordinary guy who ain't ordinary no more because of the people that join me on the channel. They elevate me. I've learned so much since I have launched this channel a little more than a year ago that I, let's say, I might even say I'm smarter. <laughs> I'm smart now, people. I was on to something before and I'm really on the, oh man, I'm super excited. Let me tell you how I'm on to something. I got a lady that's on the channel. She came on before. She lives in a town in Canada, Canada, near St. Catherine. All right, check this out. St. Catherine is, is, let's call it the last underground railroad stop. When you got there, you, you really didn't have no worries. And she going to share something with you that's going to blow your mind. Boom shaka locker on strong inspirations. I'm excited. Everything is going well here. Uh, my festival, people are signing up. We're going to have a good crowd at my Black History Festival in Kansas City, Kansas, May 27th through the 29th, 2022, in that neighborhood called Quindaro, where the slaves escaped to from Missouri to get to Kansas, because Kansas was free. And when they got to Quindaro, they had a little shot. I interviewed a guy whose great great grandfather said, Man, you come over here looking for me. I got a shot and I'm shooting back. Leave me alone. I've had enough of you, sir. Watch that video. Watch the video of the lady who says that, and I just released it uh, since this time, who says she knows some of her ancestors owned slaves out of Mobile, Alabama. And she says one day she looked up in her history, found out she had some Creole background and that there were some black people back in the day. Watch that video. Watch the video of the guy and, and I'm, 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 I'm gonna go fast cause the lady, she wait, she smiling. She said, come on, man, I got things to share with these people, but I gotta ask her to hold on just a tad long cause I got to tell this one with you. I got a guy on the channel and we were talking and I was doing the interview. He said, and you know, I, I asked the people about themselves, right? You've been watching me. You know how I go. I, I want you to know who they are. My man tells me he saw his father kill his mother. He became homeless at seven to eight. He slept in a barn. And now my man is a huge success. Mm. From that humble beginning, he was saved by some people. He had a personality, he still does. And he became a radio personality in all, uh, in Birmingham, Alabama. He know all them celebrities that came through, the James Browns and the what have you. But also he told it like it was. He said that the white people wanted to kill him. They came mm. to a place that he was thrown, where he was DJing, they was gonna kill him and the white kid said, nah, you ain't getting this dude. Watch that video. Well, I'm jamming here. Hit the subscribe button on Strong Inspirations. I don't know why you haven't subscribed yet. It's free. Hit the like button on this video. The sister, she gonna put something on your head that's gonna, that's gonna mess you up because you ain't gonna know these stories, but you heard of who she gonna talk about and I'm gonna let her introduce it. I'm not gonna tell you. 
like this video, hit the notifications bell, tell somebody about strong inspirations, don't keep it to yourself. Share the videos, watch it with your kids and all that good stuff. As I told you, I've been enlightened, but I've also had a little background because I like black history. I did this movie called Business in the Black. Watch it, 75 minutes long. It will not put you asleep. You're going to want to watch the guy at the end who's 101 years old and he's sprewing knowledge. It's in my movie, streaming on Amazon. And then read my book, everybody. Get you a copy of this. It's very reasonably priced and it's not no big book. I ain't going to lie to you. I don't read big books neither, but I'm going to read a little more this year. I'm, I, that's, that's my charge. And, and I'm going to read a big book too. <laughs> but right now, I want you to read my small book on the rise of Black business in America. You're going to like this. There's going to be some stuff in here I know you don't know. And if you know everything, I give your money back. How about that? And you get an autograph. That's that 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 might mean something one today. Watch, uh, Black Business Book. Get you a copy of it. Go to my website. I have all my stuff, the festivals and everything. It's all on the website. It's called uh, businessintheblack.net. Now I might have said this wrong. The book is called Black Business Book, but the website is businessintheblack.net. Because when you want a business, business where you want to be, you want to be in the black. You don't want to be in the red. That's not good. You're losing money. Um, you hear me use this term strong a lot, right? It's my favorite word. Uh, I just like it. And I came up with this. Strong stands for strength, tenacity, resilience, and a sense of oneness, nobility, and grace. And that is my introduction to my guest today. She's a strong lady. No question about it proficient, expert, and she loves sharing these stories. This is not her first time coming on here. She's spending time out of her day to tell you this. So let's tell them. Introduce yourself. Let's get it on. Thank you for very much coming on Strong Inspirations. Oh, thank you, Anthony. Thank you for having me once again. And thank you for your kind words. So my name is Rochelle Bush. I am the resident historian at the Salem Chapel British Methodist Episcopal Church, Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad National Historic Site in St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada. Yes. And you know what we do. I got to ask just a couple more questions. Hey, everybody, you want to know more about it, go to the other video. But the one video is you were born and raised there. Yes. And 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 so what what hospital? What, what did you have, is there a hospital in that in the in the area? You got to go to another hospital. How does that? No, no. I, I was I was born at the Hotel Du Hospital here in St. Catharines. Okay. The the hospital no longer stands though. Oh, is that right? Okay. Yeah, it was demolished. And, and, and do you have brothers and sisters? Yes, I have five siblings. I'm oh, the youngest. And, and did you ever want to leave St. Catharines? I did leave for a period of time. I lived in Toronto, and then for one summer, I lived in New York City. Oh, really? Okay. Yes. Uh, but but you were Canadian by um, with, by birth. Uh, citizenship and that kind of thing. Yes. Oh, what 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 is it like to live in Canada? Uh, in the, in the regard that um, is is not a big country. Guess, well, it is a big right? country land wise. The population is small, 35 million. Okay. And and to me, Canada is kind of like off the radar. You don't hear a? much going on a? in Canada. A, that's the word, right? A, <laughs> it is off the radar, but yes. So, Anthony, I'm a descendant of African American freedom seekers. My ancestors on my maternal side arrived from Columbia, South Carolina in 1838. So on my maternal side, my two times great grandfather, Reverend James Henry Harper, he was an AME minister. So he was a free black. So he was here in 1838. And then he was stationed in some areas in Canada. So at the time it was upper Canada or Canada West. And then he was in St. Louis for a while. And then after the US government passed the 1850 fugitive slave law, he went back to South Carolina, collected his wife and children and then relocated to St. Catharines. On my paternal side, so my father's side, 
my father's family were fugitive slaves. So runaways from Richmond, Virginia. So from Frederick County, Virginia. And they arrived in Canada in Oro in 1830. By 1861, my great grandfather was living down here in Niagara. So just about 15 miles away from St. Catharines. So both sides, maternal and paternal, were in the Niagara, Ontario area where St. Catharines is located. Mm. Uh, uh, how did they escape there? Uh, the one that was a fugitive, how did, how did, do you know anything of how that route went? Well, there was too many branches for the Underground Railroad. So we don't know actually like which route he actually took. Yeah. All we know is by 1830, the Underground Railroad was still barely known and it was definitely underdeveloped. So you have to put it into context. How we speak about the Underground Railroad today is not how folks spoke about it back in the 1850s or the oh, 1840s really? okay. because it was illegal activity and it was secret. I mean, if you were caught aiding and abetting freedom seekers who we know are runaway slaves or fugitive slaves, you were going to be incarcerated. You were going to prison. You could be fined. You could lose everything. And such as the case of John Brown, who did in fact meet Harriet Tubman in St. Catharines, if you were to do anything to overthrow slavery or to aid and abet, they were going to kill you. And he was hung. Do you know the stories that they caught somebody? Caught people? Yeah, that, 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 or, uh, uh, that helped slaves, uh, 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 particular white people. Do you know of a story like that? Well, John Brown is one of the stories. So they never captured him when he was, when he collected 11 people from Missouri. So he collected 11 freedom seekers from Missouri and brought them all the way to uh, Chicago, then to Windsor, Ontario. So it's from Detroit to Windsor. But John Brown is the one that comes to mind. So sure. another one is William Chaplin. He was trying to rescue people in 1850. So shortly before the Fugitive Slave Law passed um, in uh, the D.C. area. So it's about the, um, he, he was captured and then he was incarcerated as well. Um, there's another gentleman, his mind, his name is escaping me right now. But he was around in the early 1850s, so it was 1854. As we continue this conversation, his name will come to me, yeah, but sure. uh, he ended up disappearing. So, and, and and he was a white man. So all three of them white males. Uh, um, we can assume, and 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 just easily enough, they just hated the institution that bad. White folks. Yeah, those who helped put their life on the line for them to escape. And to yes, help in the yes. escape. Yes. Yes. And I, um, listen, I'm going to be honest with you. They hated it just as bad because um, of the miscegenation, Anthony. So this is something, you know, when you go into the critical race theory, yeah. uh, how you hear white folks, Republicans, they don't want little Bobby or Susie to be petrified about hearing about slavery. It's about what white people did and how they oppressed black folks. So when it comes to the 18, 1850s and 1840s, you can go all the way back to the inception, 1619. By 1642, Quakers are already on record telling white men, do not procreate with black women. You're diluting the newborn, your offspring. So back then they would call it uh, bleaching. So bleaching out the millennium or the, the pigmentation of the individual. So in the movie, um, 12 Years a Slave, the Solomon Northrup movie, yeah. where Brad Pitt is pay, uh, playing the part of the Canadian abolitionist. If you look at that movie, and this is what I use for the example all the time, it was perfect, 100% about enslaved people, how the abuse was there, the plantation mistress, all of them. One flaw in it. And that was when you look at all the people who were enslaved. So our ancestors, Anthony, they all looked dark complected, which was right. a lie. What happened to the people who were enslaved and they looked white or fair skinned, such as the case as uh, Ellen Craft, William and Ellen Craft, a right. famous story. Your audience can Google it. Sure. She looked European and could have passed for a white woman, but she passed for a white male during her escape. That's what upset Northern white folks. So oh, some of them man. were outraged because of that, because white people, Southerners were falsely accusing pure white people of being runaways and incarcerating them, capturing them and returning them and putting them into slavery, I should say, for the first time. So that's what was happening in the 1850s. So all the way from 1642, all the way to the Civil War. Because that's what these white men were doing. Raping black women who they were forcibly confining, 
detaching themselves from their offspring and turning their offspring into slaves that they would sell off their own children, their own flesh and blood, and they thought nothing of it. And the most famous story, these, although these kids weren't sold off, Jefferson and Hemings, they were his offsprings, but they were still enslaved by him and they looked like white people. Wow, yes. that's a good, oh man, thank you for telling well, that. So now uh, as a result, there were white people saying, hey, look at what you're doing to the population. And you oh, said 100%, that. percent, a hundred percent. Cornell University has this web page up and it's a project that they're working on and it's called Freedom on the Move. They're actually collecting fugitive slave narrative, like uh, the reward posters. And you can see the descriptions of the people. Some of them are described as white or chestnut or blonde and green eyes. I mean, the famous story of Harriet Tubman rescuing Charles Null, blonde and green eyes. I mean, they look like white folks. <laughs> and and sometimes they got it wrong is what you said just a second ago. And, and the person was white. That's right. That's right. But then that could have been some type of vendetta too. They could have been malicious. I mean, come on, they were Southerners. <laughs> These people were, uh, they were not nice people. Let's just put it, I'll be kind on your show. They oh, weren't no nice question. people to begin with. <laughs> so now uh, on some hand, we talk about, and we're going to get to the story at hand, but I, I like where you go, where you went with this. On some hand, we thought that the light-skinned people had a better way of things. No. Is that, that's not necessarily no. true. No, and you hear that all the time. They're always claiming that light-skinned folks were, you know, the house Negroes and right. they were favored by master. That is a lie. Just read Harriet Tubman's narrative. Her mother was in the house. Her father was his favorite overseer until he uh, obtained his freedom. These are all people who were of a darker hue. They weren't of a lighter hue and they were in the house. So how can that be possible? Yeah, right. Okay, now you really got me on something. So he- Well, no, it's a narrative that was created in the 20th century. Nobody was favored, nobody. And 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 I mean, then somebody not unless they were sleeping with them. And somebody asked me the other day, said, "Well, what was the white woman's take on this? Knowing her husband was was having sex with these with these uh, with these women." Well, they couldn't do much anyways because women had no rights, and half of them were sick and demented. All they cared about was having the luxury and the wealth. Mary Chestnut, a Civil War general's wife, at the end. Um, of her diary, well, in I can't say at the end, in her diary, she states she couldn't wait for the shots to ring out at Fort Sumner for the Civil War to begin because then plantation mistresses no longer had to lie about these biracial or multiracial children falling from the sky. So that way, they no longer had to turn a blind eye to their husband or whoever raping Black women who were forcibly confined. That was part yeah. of the, the, the story they said they fell out of the sky? Well, they had to lie All and right. create, like, everybody wanted to know where these kids were coming from if they were on these plantations, who was fathering them. So the plantation mistress would lie and they'd create stories and they'd, you know, they'd blow it off. They'd talk about the neighboring plantation and that husband procreating with all the enslaved black women and talk about how disgusting it was for that wife to put up with it. But when it came to their own backyard and their own house, they'd lie and say, well, we don't know where these kids from. They fell out of the sky. Yeah. That's in her diary, Mary Chestnuts. Really? Oh man, I love oh, yeah. it. Now, so what you then the other thing you said something about Harriet Tubman and, and everybody, that's the basis of the story tonight. Her, her you you talking about Harriet Tubman. But what did you say at the house? The Harriet Tubman's father did what now? Harriet Tubman's father purchased, he he was able to buy his freedom in by 1840. So by 1840, he was a free black man. But prior to that, okay, let me stop you How old do you think she is at that point? Harriet Tubman? Yeah. By 1840, maybe 18 years old. So she was born, um, scholars today think around 1822. So some think it's solid, but there's no conclusive evidence. Right. So anywhere between 1820 and 1825. So she was still a young woman when he purchased his freedom. So he was a favored overseer working in the timber fields. So his enslaver at the time was Brodus. Then there was Doc Thompson. There were others. Her mother was enslaved as well, but her mother worked in the house. So when you look at Harriet Tubman, does she look like the light-skinned female to you? No, no, she doesn't. No, exactly. And her mother was in the house. There were plenty that were in the house. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not sit sitting up here defending 
uh, light skinned people or dark skinned people. I'm yeah. defending the narrative yeah, and the sure. historical accuracy. I love it. So, so Harriet grew up kind of privileged. No, no, because when she was younger, she witnessed her two sisters being sold off into a chain gang. So her most famous narrative when she's in Canada, she states that she believes slavery is the next thing to hell. But she starts off saying that she grew up like a neglected weed. And she said she was fearful every time she seen a white man coming around, you know, the Dorchester County plantation. So she was fearful. She said every time I seen a white man, she was afraid because she witnessed her two sisters when she was a small child being sold off in a chain gang. Uh, but uh, so why didn't it, her father uh, uh, and I'm, I, you know, maybe I shouldn't because he had the privilege that he had to be in the house. He had he, his life maybe wasn't as bad. Is that the case? The mother was in the house. The father was in the timber forest. So he was like a, a lumberman. OK. Yes. So that's um, not a bad job. Maybe that's not a, that's not picking cotton and being beat all the time and that kind of thing. That's correct. Um, but you could still, you were able to communicate with free blacks. So the sailors, the blackjacks that would, you know, sail up and down the Chesapeake or along the Delaware River. And they would bring back information from Washington, Baltimore, New York City, Philadelphia. But with, in Tubman's case, so the family was privileged, but it wasn't at the same time. So he was able to keep the family close knit and together, those that weren't sold off. Did she get an but, education? Harriet Tubman? Yes. No. So there's one part in her narrative that um, she would have to walk the Broda school children back and forth to school. So she would sit on the, on the school steps and she would listen to the instructor, the teacher. So there was a point in her narrative where the teacher um, was asking one of the children to spell Baker and the kid couldn't do it. And Harriet stood up and said, B-A-K-E-R. And she did that from the front door. Yeah, that was... That was uh, quite thrilling to read that about yeah. Harriet Tubman. And as, you, as we know, Black people were forbidden of, um, to learn how to read and write. So it was pretty much the law. You could not learn how to read and write because one of, it was one of the dynamics of slavery. Keep us you know, oppressed, keep our intellectual capacity low. And what we didn't know, we wouldn't learn. When you say that she witnessed them being sold off, can you give me an example of how she might have seen that and, and how that might have occurred? Well, so with uh, so the separation of family was the number one um, dynamic in slavery. That was how you can control and abused individuals. Because just so let me just fast forward. By the time they escaped and made it to Canada or made it to free states and they're thinking of their loved ones, of course, they developed mental health issues because it was difficult. So what the enslaver would do, so either he needed the money because he was trying to pay off a debt or it was time to abuse somebody. Either way, you had to control the audience, the captive audience, and those were the people that were enslaved. So if someone was about to be sold off or if someone was about to be beat, most times if they were about to be beat, you gathered everybody around the plantation and forced them to watch. If you didn't want an outburst or any type of craziness, or any type of a ruckus, if you were selling them off, then you could do that under the cover of darkness so nobody would know. So the individual would just disappear. But then there are other occasions where it was another lesson. We're gonna teach you that if you don't straighten out and do my bidding and bend to my will, then you're gonna be sold off into a chain gang like these individuals. Yes. So, so it might've, they might've just said, okay, uh, they went in the, in, the, in the house, in the cabin and grabbed them and then oh, just yeah. took them away. That's right. And in the case of one of Harriet Tubman's brothers, so someone got word to her mother that one of her sons was going to be sold off. Well, we don't know. Nobody knows which son it was. So the mother went and collected her son and then hid him in the forest. And then when the enslaver and the trader, the slave trader, who the purchaser, um, went to their home, to her cabin, she cussed them out and told them, no, you're not getting her son. So she was that defiant in that way as well. So they were privileged, but then again, they were not because they never collected her son. She wasn't going to have it. Um, and all this developed uh, and made Harriet who she became. Oh, 100%. 100%. So let's not forget that when she had received her head injury, 
she was between 12 and 13 years old. We don't know because we don't know her true date of birth. After that, um, they said she wasn't worth half a sixpence. Then if you Google that, that's anywhere between 10 cents and 50 cents in today's uh, currency. So she was put to work with her father in the timber fields. So in the timber forests, I should say. So from there, she's learning with um, all black males. She's an all black male network, those that are enslaved and those that are free black. And she's learning about the Underground Railroad. Yes. Uh, what you just said there, let's, let me ask this question. There were free and, and non-free Blacks doing the same job? No, these were the sailors. So those that would okay, come in and I collect the timber and take it to, uh, you know, the major cities. I got you. Yes. Uh, what, what could have been a happy time for Harry? While enslaved? Yes. You're asking the wrong person to, because to me, nothing. If you're enslaved, there is nothing a happy time. But you may have a, a nice moment that you get to hug your mother or kiss your father. But outside of that, I can't, I can't imagine anything being a happy time for anybody who's enslaved. Okay, okay. So uh, Harriet moves along. Harriet, is, is she short, tall? Or, well, I mean, what's she's her tiny. height, do they say? She's, she's tiny. She's very petite, about five feet tall, maybe 100 pounds but physically fit, very strong. Um, yes. And, 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 uh, and she's, she, I mean, that small, but she, like you say, she's physically fit and mentally tough. Yes. Oh, yes. She, she grew to not fear them anymore, no matter what they did to her. That's right. She said that when it was time for her to go, the Lord would let them kill her. What she had no fear. Dynamic is that? Wow. Oh, she had no fear. We're talking about Harriet Tubman. <laughs> no so fear when, whatsoever. When is, when is her first? When is her first escape? And for herself, her, or let's well, say escaped, for herself, she escaped in the fall of 1849. So the first uh, wanted poster, and it's the only one that's in existence. It's her and her two brothers. Uh, the reward was a hundred dollars, and that was um, in September 1849. They caused her to go back, so they forced her to, and then she escaped shortly after that. Then in, they and then she made it to Philadelphia. Her two brothers. Oh. So that was in the fall of 1849. In December 1850. Okay, let me stop you. How far did she get? To Philadelphia. And they told so her to go back for what reason, do you think? Oh, with her two brothers when they first yes. started out? Yes. Nobody knows how far they got. No, but I'm saying nobody knows. Yeah, but why did they force her to go back then? That's, I guess that's my question. Well, it could have been uh, for many reasons. The number one reason why people did not escape is because they didn't want to leave their loved ones behind. That took a strong will to leave your husband, to leave your wife, to leave your children, to leave your parents, yeah. just to leave your loved ones. Yeah. Nobody wanted to do that. Right, I got so you. So those those that eventually did escape, there was the common denominator. They were going to be sold off anyways. So if they were going to be sold, such as Harriet Tubman, she knew she was going to be sold off. So if she wasn't going to see her loved ones anymore, then it was going to be on her terms and conditions. So she ran to Philadelphia and then eventually extended her Underground Railroad route to Canada. So if you know you're not going to be sold off, you're going to stay with your family. But if you know you're going to be sold, you're out of there. How, how does she know how to go in this Underground Railroad? I mean, you told me about the sailors and stuff like that. But, you know, who, who tells her, OK, Harry, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go right, stay that way, go down, hit that bush, and you're going to see a house. Most of it, she said, were premonitions and guidance through the Lord. So oh, she really? talked to Jesus on a daily basis. But while she was enslaved, she learned about um, the network of the Underground Railroad in Maryland. So her narrative states that during her, her escape, she went to a white woman's house. They presume it was a Quaker woman where she stayed. And then that Quaker woman sent her on to the next safe house. But everything else, premonitions, gut instincts, she said she relied on the Lord. Is there a, a chronicle of her route? No, um, but what there is, is a, a chronicle of Frederick Douglass's route that she confirmed. 
So Frederick Douglass stated in his um, 1881 biography that the Underground Railroad had many branches, but the one he was connected with started in Baltimore. Then it went to Wilmington, Delaware, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, New York City, Albany, then uh, Albany, New York, then Syracuse, then Rochester, then Suspension Bridge, then St. Catharines, Ontario, where I'm at now. Then yeah. Harriet Tubman confirmed that almost a decade later. Okay, now I, that, that's that's different than some of the story I heard about him, and I'm gonna we're gonna get back to Harriet. I heard that he got on a boat and had a false ID that didn't even look like him. Frederick Douglass? Yes. Oh yeah, their um, forged passages were um, all the time, all the time. So I can't. Some were forged, and then some were borrowed. So yes, and he, as far as I know, he was uh, trying to pass himself off as a sailor as well. Right. That's right. That's what I got. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And that that was his route. So he, so when they when they do this, how, how long do you think it takes like uh, to get to, let's say, St. Catherine or something like that? Is that a three month, four month journey when you when you leave the plantation wherever you are? Well, it so it depends on how you're traveling. So in Harriet Tubman's time. So right. we'll just pretend it's December 1851. Right. Um, we'll say it took three weeks. Now we'll go to December 1855 when the railroad trains are fully operational all the way to Niagara Falls. So now it's only going to take 10 days. Oh, I got it. Most traveled when the railroad cars were um, operational. Most folks traveled by train and they called it cars. So that's what you needed the money for. Tubman always took the trains when she could. Absolutely. So she gets so she gets to St. Catherine and and then she what makes her go back and start doing these other routes to go, I mean, back and forth to the she's south. going back to collect her family and loved ones. So when she crossed the Mason Dixon line and entered into Philadelphia, she looked, she said she literally looked at her hands and looked at the sun, and she was, you know, communicating with God again. And she said, Well, if I'm free, why can't they be free? So that was her mission to go back and collect her family and her loved ones, all that she could. So some she physically guided, like she literally guided them and others she gave instructions and helped them make it to St. Catharines. The, is, it of a, is it noted that someone tried to turn her in? Another slave? Um, there's only one, one, and this is about the Do Dover H rescue. So this is in March, 1857. Um, eight people escape from Dorchester County. They make it to Dover, Delaware. And the individual's name is Thomas Otwell. So when they make it to Delaware, to Camden, um, Thomas with Otwell. Them. No, he pretends he's their, he's their guide. He drops Tubman's name. He said he knows Harriet. So he decides he's going to guide them to Dover, Delaware. What they didn't know is he already had conspired with his white landlord. He said he was going to take them to Dover, Delaware, into the jail, and they would collect the money and split the reward for these eight fugitives. So his name was Thomas Otwell. You know, your audience can Google it. It's a, a true story. Tubman was in St. Catharines when this was happening, and it was became international breaking news because what happened is Otwell's guiding them up the stairs, and one of the fugitives decides you know he looks at the windows and he said i don't like the looks of this room because it had bars on the window and all he could see was the moon shining through so he steps out into the hallway the sheriff's actually coming up the stairs when the sheriff notices them stepping out into the hallway he turns around and goes back to his quarters well they follow him the sheriff's trying to get his pistols so one male smashing out the window so the other can jump out one other male is fighting with the sheriff and another one sticks a shovel in the fireplace and tries to burn the place down, sets it on fire so they could all escape. So they ended up being separated. Then they meet up again in Philadelphia. Then they make it to New York City and then they eventually make it to St. Catharines. So while this happens, the March 13th in Dover, Delaware, it becomes headline news straight across North America. So you know how we hear breaking news now, right? Okay. And then can you imagine the delight of the abolitionists because it became a rallying cry because everybody was wondering would they actually make it to Canada and St. Catharines and they did. Oh, when yeah. you say everybody was wondering, it became new when somebody escaped uh, the enslaver. 
would put out the word and, and that made news. Well, they would put up wanted posters, but not all enslavers did because for some it was embarrassment and humiliation. Yeah, sure. So others, they, you know, they were on the hunt. So let's let's get it right. It was the bloodhound hunt. That's what white folks were doing. I, it was the slavery question, Anthony, right? All they cared about. So when James Mason introduced the bill on January 4th, 1850 for the 1850 Fugitive Slave Law, all they had been talking about from 1793, these white men, all the way up to 1850 is how were they going to retrieve their runaways? They didn't give a darn about nothing else. All they cared about is the ones that got away because that was on their mind. And what did they want to do in 1850? Expand the territory, expand slavery. That's all now, they cared about. Um, when we talk about it, is there, I, I've, I've, I've heard some, some reports and stuff like that, that it, let's say if there are, and I, I'm, I'm picking numbers and then I, this, and my numbers I'm picking only to, so you can understand my, my question. If there are, um, uh, uh, 10,000 slaves, what percentage of them did try to escape in some form or fashion? Okay, so when we're going we're gonna to look at the numbers and I'm going to have to bring in another documentary that was already published. Yeah. So um, a famous Black historian, I don't know whether you want me to name names or yeah, whatever. Yeah, you can. You know what yeah, I, mean? sure, sure. I can? Okay, yeah, so Dr. Sure. Henry Louis Gates then. So 2013, he publishes through PBS, right? Um, many Rivers to Cross, the African-American experience, Many Rivers to Cross. If you go to episode number one, right? And I talk about this on my tours. If you go to episode number one, by 1790, he's saying that 750,000 people of African descent are enslaved in the United States. By 1861, Anthony, 4 million at the start of the Civil War. So in 1807, the British banned the slave trade. Right. You can no longer go to Africa and capture Africans and bring them back. Right. In 1808, the United States is forced to do the same. Right. So how are they going to increase the slave population? Well, white men decide they're going to procreate with enslaved women, or they're going to have forced marriages, or they're going to do whatever they're going to do. So when you look at it, all these historians between 1790 and 1861, they believe National Park Service, when you go to their webpage, um, that between 30 and 50,000 people escaped to the northern states in Canada. Seriously, are they out of their minds? It'd have to be 100,000 or more. There's no possibility. There's more reward posters out there during those decades than there are the numbers that they come up with, 30 to 50,000. So the National Park Service Network to Freedom they believe it's 100,000 or higher. I definitely believe it's 100,000 or higher. So they're just going on what, they're, what they think they can find and what is being reported sure, because sure. not everybody reported it. Some were humiliated. So, so, you, so you, we can assume if that's, let's say, let's go with the high number. What is that? Uh, 15, 20% of the, of the total number maybe? Yeah, I, I would say about 15%. So okay. when you go with the low numbers, um, think of an arena of 50,000, right? When you go with the low numbers, right? an arena with 50,000, you're only looking at one to two runaways out of 50,000. No, that cannot be possible. Uh, I, I got you. Now, I like the, it. I like what you're saying. Yes. Yeah. That's, come on. That's not possible. The numbers are a lot higher. It went unreported. And let's be honest. These are white folks writing history books because black people don't have black, our black voices can't get out there yet. We can't yes. get past white people. Yes. If we could write our narrative our way and the story would be told to all children, black and white, we know the numbers are much higher. There is no way you're telling me that 30 to 50,000 or even 100,000 escaped between 1790 and 1861. What's that saying about us as a people and resistance? Like the runaways, that was the number one form of resistance. We all know that. Okay. But don't tell me the numbers are so low because I'm never going to believe it. Oh, I got you. Because, I mean, who wants to stay in that condition? Exactly. exactly. Right. right, right. I got you. And so Harriet Tubman is not, is she the, why is she the most well-known person? Uh, number one, she's female. Number two, she was ruthless. 
And number three, she suffered from a disability. Oh, so her head injury. Her head injury. Back then, they called it sleeping spells because she could fall asleep at any given moment. Today, they call it um, narcolepsy, a uh, temporal lobe syndrome, or seizures. They say she suffered from seizures as well. Oh, so it, it, there's somebody else out there who might have helped more people escape than she did. Um, well, they say there's a gentleman by the names of James Mason, James Mason who was piloting people to uh, Hamilton over a thousand, but she's well known because again, she's female and she was important. Tubman had no fear. Tubman loved the Lord. Jesus was her guide. And she was in, she's inspiring. Yeah, and no and I'm forgetting the best part. She was the female in a network of men. Don't forget it was a man's world back then. 100%. She was a voice and she was undercover, code name Moses. So they didn't even know who they were looking for. Oh, really? So they didn't even know her name for the most part. No, they did not because when and through her famous quote here that's in uh, the North Side View of Slavery written by um Benjamin Drew, she gave her real name and that was to kind of throw them off and give the false impression that she was stationed in Canada and, you know, not moving out of Canada at all. She was living there. That way they didn't know that she was going back and forth. So it wasn't until John Brown was captured and they seized his um, documents that they found out it was Harriet Tubman. Uh, how many trips do they think that she made? Is there a number? No of less than 13. So all the numbers and everything she did are arguable. There's no conclusive evidence. And that's because the Underground Railroad was unlawful and Ill illegal activity. Yeah. So those that were keeping records, once John Brown was captured, they lost them. So when she was living, so for 50 years that she lived, the number, the standard was 19 plus. Tubman never argued against that. Um, now after her death, scholars who are now delving into her history, um, they're saying that it was 13. So here from Canada, we say no less than 13, okay. but we do not discount the 19. She also did other things like, uh, and I, I quote this in my book too, she, she, she led a, a troop of Union soldiers. No, oh, yeah. In up the, the Cumbahee River. Yes, up the Cumbahee River. And uh, there she was with Colonel Montgomery. Um, and she had her uh, group of nine men. And... I mean, they went into Confederate territory. They sacked barns. They, you know, set cotton on fire, took whatever they wanted. And um, I believe the number was 756 people that were freed. Oh. Yeah. yeah. So she was part of the Port Royal experiment. So Governor Andrew from Massachusetts asked her to join uh, the Port Royal experiment. She was uh, stationed in Beaufort um, and Hilton Head. How, how, how did she make a living? How did she, you know, you, you got to have some money somewhere along the way, I suspect. So when she was en enslaved, she negotiated, when she was an older woman, she negotiated a piece of property from her enslaver so that she could uh, toil the land, grow vegetables, and she would sell it at the market. Um, she was able to do that. So that money she kept for herself. When she was freed, so after she freed herself, self-emancipated, when she was in Philadelphia, she worked in the hotels and she worked as a domestic. Uh, she did the same thing in Cape May, New Jersey. In St. Catharines, our records are scant. We don't know what she did. Uh, so, but it, because it was a tourist, a tourist town, we're going to assume that she worked in the hotel industry as well as she did in other places because there was a lot of hotels here. Plus, we do know that she operated a boarding house. So the boarding house, she probably received uh, rent money from those that were living with her as well. Oh, so she's even enterprising lady. Oh, a hundred percent. And she was paid for hire as Moses. So the Tilly account from December, for, excuse me, October, 1856, um, an enslaved woman by the name of Tilly, her fiance hired Moses, who was Harriet Tubman, to go back to Maryland to collect her. Oh, so she even, you know, you gotta, you know, you pay me, I'll go back and get somebody. Oh, that, that's what she didn't saying. care about them. She knew the route like the back of her hand. And she said she had no fear of them, meaning white folks or Southerners, finding her and killing her, whether she was in, you know, Maryland, New York State, Philadelphia, or Canada. Didn't matter to her because she was going to shoot him anyways. I mean, here it's something carried a pistol. When it he shot you in the name of Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh, yeah. Is it known that she that she shot somebody, killed somebody? No, there's, there's rumors. So 
Okay. Part of her fam- one of her family branch thinks that she did. Others uh, say no. But that Thomas Otwell story I was telling you about the Dover 8. Yes. After she collected all the intel from the Dover 8 when she got, when they arrived in St. Catharines, <laughs> she disappeared for a little bit. And you know, I mean, William still has the account that she said she was going south. So she, you know, nobody heard from Thomas Otwell after that. And all I can tell you is uh, George Reynolds out in Ohio because it was the Underground Railroad was tight, right? Um, for some folks, it was loosely based, but for other folks, it was not loosely based. Um, Reynolds said, when you've got a traitor, you got to kill him. You got to take them out first because what are they going to do? They're going to tell the white man everything. Well, yeah. uh, uh, we're going to get to another part of some other story about your, your grandfather and his, his ministry to her. Well, what, what, what was her closest call? Is there, is there one moment that could, we could say was the closest call that she could have got caught, killed, or otherwise? Out of all of her narratives? Yes. Yes, there is one where she's walking down the street in Maryland. This is just my pick. Walking down the street in Maryland. Um, and she hears her former enslaver. So one of them. She sees him on horseback coming towards her and she purchased two chickens because usually you operate it at nighttime for whatever reason in this account, she had to operate in daytime. And she's carrying these two chickens that they, they say are foul, which is what they are, foul at the time. And when he was passing her by, she let go of them so that they would flutter all over the place and she would run and chase them. So all he would think is, well, it's just some crazy old woman has to go collect these chickens. So yeah. he could have seen, he could have ran into her. Oh, absolutely. If she was just walking down the road, yes. Yeah. That was one call. Then another one's on where she's on a train in Maryland. And of course, Tubman couldn't read or write because that was forbidden to educate Black people. Um, she's on a train and they're looking for her. Wanted posters are everywhere. And she decides that she's just going to pick up this book or the newspaper. Nobody knows exactly what it was. And all she could think was, I hope I'm holding it upright because a white man, a, you know, a collective of white men and women were saying, you know, a, a nice reward for this individual. It could have been the $10,000 reward for her, um, but they were looking for her and she was dressed like a free black woman. So very nicely dressed. And one gentleman says that can't be her because the woman we're looking for can't read or write. So Tubman said she chuckled to herself and said, I must be holding this book upright. So at some point, she's the most wanted fugitive there is. For Maryland. For Maryland. Absolutely. For Maryland. So okay. who knows? But in, in my opinion, I'm going to agree with you. So because there's other fugitives out there, correct? Yeah, sure. We don't know what they were trying to do with James Mason or any others. But in my opinion, yeah, 100% Harriet Tubman. But here's the thing, with scholars now looking at her history, we don't know the rewards. So when she was living, um, the, re the, the account was, it was a $40,000 reward, whether it was rumored or not. We do know that uh, Thomas Wentworth Higginson, he writes in um, a letter to his mother saying the reward for her was $12,000. She told Charlotte Fortin that the reward was $10,000. And we do know that there was um, a collective of Maryland slaveholders who pooled their money together to collect this, to try to capture um, this elusive person who was helping um, slaves free themselves in Maryland. So total, it was probably $40,000 or more from various groups trying to get, capture her. Yeah. Uh, uh, does she get a claim? Um like a godlike figure back in those days, you know, I mean, everybody knew even among the slaves, everybody had heard the stories of her. She's written about in the papers. Does the president well, she, she try to meet her? Any of those kind of things? She wasn't written about in the papers when she was an active underground railroad conductor. Right. So what in, enslaved people did say about her was that she was Moses and she got the charm. So she said, white folks can't catch her because she's got the charm. So in other words, protected by God. Um, and, and she believed she had supernatural powers as well. She states in her narrative that, you know, um, she had the opportunity to meet Lincoln, but chose not to. She met his wife, Mary Todd Lincoln. Oh, really? Um, yes. 
but there are other accounts where people, of course, would want to meet with her, Black folks. Um, it was Black people all the way up until Earl Conrad wrote the book about her in the early 1940s. So white folks weren't necessarily interested. Uh, Wilbur Siebert sought her out. He was a professor from Ohio. He interviewed her in the eight, early 1890s, but white folks weren't interested in her narrative any more than they were truly interested in Frederick Douglass's. The only reason why they were interested in Douglass's is because he was a man. Um, but for Harriet Tubman at that time, no. It wasn't until Conrad wrote that book about her. So you had to say, I, let me put it this way, abolitionists, northerners. So those folks were interested, but southerners, they weren't interested. So, but Sarah Bradford continued. She wrote two books about Harriet Tubman. Her white friends still paid attention uh, to her and what was happening with her. But for the most part, when it came to big publishers, they weren't interested. It was Earl Conrad who got the book published through Carter G. Woodson, his book. Then Tubman started to become a phenomenon. Other Black people started writing more books about her, but they say they were more juvenile books. And it wasn't until truly the 21st century that three books about Tubman came out around 2003 and 2004. So there was interest, but then there truly was an interest. Right. Now she's huge. Yeah, she's huge. So now this leads to how did she die? What was her final years? How did, you know... Yeah, she died of natural causes of old age at her home in Auburn, New York, surrounded by clergy and her nurse. Yes. Okay. You 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 told me that your uh, your ancestor, great great grandfather, was her minister. Yes. So when Harriet Tubman first arrived, it was the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, and my two times when he first arrived in St. Catherine. Yeah, if they were AME churches. When Tubman arrived, it, we severed our ties with the AME in 1856 because nobody would go back to the United States for the AME conference because you could be captured under the 1850 Fugitive Slave Law Act. So when Tubman arrived in St. Catharines, um, my two times great grandfather was here, Reverend James Henry Harper, and he was the minister in charge at the Salem Chapel for a period of time. So he literally preached to her. He knew Harriet Tubman. I mean, just to think about that, that my ancestors were connected with her in some way is just thrilling. Yeah, it is. What was her personal life like this, as we kind of come to a close? Did she get married, have kids, any of those kind of things? No children. She was married twice um, to John Tubman, um, was her first husband, but he didn't share her dream of freedom. So she left him behind when she was about to be sold. So she left him behind in Maryland. When she went back to collect him, he had another wife. So she stayed single while throughout the, her Underground Railroad career. Then after the Civil War, another gentleman sought her out. His name was Nelson Davis. He was 20 plus years younger than her. And she married him in Auburn, New York in 1869. So she actually knew him when she was in South Carolina for part of the Port Royal experiment. So he was a soldier. Yeah, but about the kids now, White folks have written that Harriet Tubman left a baby behind in Maryland because there's a narrative about a young girl by the name of Margaret Stewart who stated that who's after Margaret died, when Earl Conrad introduced, interviewed, excuse me, Margaret's daughter, Alice Brickler, Alice is saying that um, Harriet Tubman kidnapped her mother. So this is going back to the 1830s, 1840s. And white scholars today, two white women, um, are saying that Harriet Tubman left a baby behind in Maryland while she became the conductor Moses on the Underground Railroad. Up here in Canada, no chance in hell we are confirming or believing that narrative. Because Harriet Tubman, if she was collecting her loved ones yeah. and bringing them to freedom, right. the North or Canada, she would have brought her baby with her. <laughs> Yeah. She had her family up here in St. Catharines. Her baby would have been here in Canada. She right. would have not left her baby in slavery. That is a lie. Right. That's how we see it. White uh, folks can uh, believe you, you change conduct that narrative. Tours. Uh, is anything uh, still standing that she might, a building she might have gone in? Or do you know a park she's 
went to a home she lived in is any of that still a standing or what can you on your tour say this was what harriet was well it's the church so the salem chapel yeah, that yeah, she attended right. so right. that church was constructed between 1853 and 1855 when she was living in saint Catharines. right so where she worshiped where the boarding house which was behind the church that she was um, um operating that's no longer there so that was torn down but the church is the harriet tubman site and so you can say harriet sat in the, in in that corner well we can say that she sat in the original pews somewhere right. we yeah, don't know right. exactly where she sat yeah yeah right right right, right. unbelievable yes. now oh, yeah. and so you you uh, tell us how, how do people uh, uh su support you and your tours and and what's your website and, and that kind of thing oh, my website is tubman tours canada.com and that's the same with my facebook page tubman tours canada and you can now uh, seek me out on either page <laughs> yeah, we see Harriet Tubman as a revolution, a God-loving, God-fearing revolutionary. Ooh, boy, I tell you, he has strong inspirations. Don't we give it to you, my friends? Oh, man, I found the lady. I found the lady for sure. Oh, my God. And I Thank am you. super excited. She comes on the channel. Man, we got to come up there, everybody, and go and do her tour. Thank you. Andrew. Uh, uh, and, and you being so proficient in this, I, I, are you gonna write a book? Is there a book? Or I'm working on it. I'm working on one now. Something like that. Yeah, yes. you got to do it. You got to do it. I'm working on one now. I got to do it. What What made you, other than finding this out, uh, spend so much time of your life doing this? The truth. The historian at the church. Uh, so my predecessor passed away. And there was nobody willing to take that position because you got to give up a lot. It's volunteer work. It's it's not a paid position. So you have to love your ancestral history and you have to love the work. So there was a two year void and I was living in Toronto at the time. So some black folks down here and some from Toronto, unbeknownst to me, decided that it would be best to hand over the history to the white people here at the museum. So African-Americans would get on the bus, come to St. Catharines and learn the history of Harriet Tubman and their ancestors through the lens of white folks. No way. <laughs> so I uprooted myself, left Toronto and moved back to St. Catharines so that that did not happen. So we compete, like we're, we're, we're all good friends now, the museum as well as the church, we work together, many partnerships, but we are still competing for not the narrative, the dollar, the tourism dollar. Because at the church right now, it's the tourism that sustains us. We only have seven members. Seven. Mm. It's the tourism dollars that keeps our doors open so that we can worship on Sundays. And it's the tourism dollars that allows us to stand in the church and tell our ancestral history from our perspective. There wasn't nothing positive about slavery or the Underground Railroad. We don't want to keep it positive. We want the truth to be told right. so that you can face what your people did and then we all can heal. Because while they keep sanitizing it and whitewashing it, nobody's healing. Oof. Oh, man, you made me think one more question. Is there, did, did Harriet Tubman have a saying? A song, you? Yeah. No, what? a saying. You know how you might say something like, "Oh, a saying." Yeah, a saying. A saying. You know, some motto or you she know something two. that the way she said goodbye or anything she like had, that that was truly she, Harriet. No, she had too many, too many sayings. So when you're looking at her quote, so you're wondering if there's a common saying that she always came up with, other than her hanging on to the Lord or Jesus, I'm going to hold steady on to you. No, because she did have. Um, others so for you. example i love it a dead man tells no tales but she didn't say dead man uh she dropped the end bone because back then you could um yeah i can't think of one common one yeah yeah i got you one common you. one no oh boy oh boy oh boy if you don't like this video i'm telling you i'm gonna give you some more you're gonna have to get around to it <laughs> boom shaka laka here we go Straight no chaser. I let the people do the talking, and this sister right here, unbelievable. This has become her calling. 
Hit Thank the you, subscribe Anthony. button, everybody. Hit the like button, everybody. Hit the notification bell, everybody. Tell somebody about Strong Inspirations. Go up, support that tour, that church. Support this lady and her efforts. She's given of her life for us now. Let's give something back to her, all right? Uh, to you, I say my sister, and I say this with all sincerity. You know how I do. I want you to stay strong, stay safe, stay Thank on you. your grind. I love what you're doing and how you have picked up the mantle on this note. Thank you. Thank you so very much for coming on Strong Inspirations. With that, I'll say bye-bye. Thank, Thank, Thank you for you. having me. Yes. Bye.